As we want to continue on with the book of Mark, we want to take us to the place where we left off. But as we continue on to read this passage, we will see how God himself has prepared his son Jesus for the public ministry to reveal the glory of God and also to expand his kingdom. Today is a preparation for tomorrow. Today is a preparation for tomorrow. Everything that happens in today, that is something to prepare for tomorrow. As a Christian, as a children of God, nothing will end for the purpose of today. Everything that happens, the stage that I am in, in this junction of my life, God wants to use today to prepare me for tomorrow. There is always a better tomorrow. There will be hope and vision. God wants us to take to higher horizon and expand our territories. That's why God has given us today to prepare us for tomorrow. And we can see from today's passage, God the Father had prepared His Son for tomorrow and for the public ministry and for the sake of his people. So let's go back to the book of Mark, chapter 1. We want to start with the verse 9 through 28. It's a little bit long, but I'd like to invite Angie today to alternate with our reading. But if we can alternate the passage together, because everything that is spoken out of my mouth must be aligned with what is written in the scriptures. Amen? So that's why we need to turn our eyes to the Bible. Make sure Pastor Shine is not going off the track of the passage. So let's read it together. Let's fix our eyes to the Word of God together. Book of Mark chapter 1 verse 9 through 28. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with the authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately, and immediately his, his fame, fame spread, spread throughout, throughout all, all the region around the Galilee. As we read the passage, John the Baptist prepared the way, the first coming of Jesus Christ, and he was baptizing the people. And by then, as Jesus grew up in the town of Nazareth, came to the river of Jordan to be baptized by 
John the Baptist. And he was baptized, and then the heaven opened up, the Spirit, like a dove, descended upon Jesus. And then there was a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately, Holy Spirit will take Jesus to the wilderness. There, he was tempted and he was tried by Satan for 40 days. And there, he was with the wild beasts and also with the holy angels. Then, he went to the Galilee and began his ministry, proclaiming the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then, immediately, as soon as he preached the gospel, he will call his disciples, Andrew and Peter, and then John and James. And also, he went to, into synagogue, began to teach the word of God. People were all amazed because he was not like one of the scribes, but he had an authority in his teaching. And people were amazed. Then, in the midst of synagogue, in congregation, there was one man who was a demon-possessed, and he commanded a demon to come out of that man. And also, people were so shocked. What doctrine? What is this? With authority, he will command the demons even, and they will come out, obeying him. And his fame went out to all the regions in Galilee and down to Jerusalem, as we see. And from here, we can see how God, before Jesus went to Galilee, to preach the gospel, to call his disciples, to cast the demons out, and begin to heal the people. God prepared Jesus. Even he was a Messiah, but he was prepared for the purpose of kingdom of God. And we ourselves, by observing how the Father prepared his Son for the public ministry, we want to be prepared as well. All of us as Christians we have an indwelling Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's desire is to be used by God for His glory and for His purpose. We do have vision to be used by God, whether as a businessman, businesswoman, as housewives, or as pastors, or as missionaries. All of us have desire in our spirit to glorify God and to be used for His kingdom purpose. But we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Prepared the people will be used by God. Without preparation, God cannot use us. So let's take a look at the passage. As we go through the passage, we will realize John was baptizing the people. This baptism, a little bit of background understanding. In the old law, the people were required to come before God, washing their hands, washing their body. Water is element to cleanse us. Water symbolically tells us it's a cleansing device. When you wash a dish, you use water to wash. When you wash your clothes, you need a water just like that. The priest had to wash their body before they come to the tabernacle to minister God. So water means washing, washing our uncleanness, washing our sins away. And as time passed by, there came a tradition in Jewish culture. If you are a Gentile, if you are descendants of Ishmael or Egyptians, then to become proselyte, in other words, to, for you to be converted into Judaism, you need to wash yourself. Why? Because the Gentiles were considered as unclean tribes. So you need to wash yourselves. And so people will, Jewish people will baptize Gentile proselytes to enter into Judaism to worship God of Israel. But John the Baptist's baptism is to prepare the hearts of the people so that they may be aware of their sinful nature to know coming Messiah will provide actual remissions of their sins. Then... Here comes Jesus from Nazareth. He is the creator. He is the king of kings. He is the king of the universe. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. And Jesus, the son of God, was with him. He created all things, both visible and invisible. 
Jesus created along with the Father and the Spirit. And this Creator will come to the John the Baptist, who is the only mere human being, even though he was endowed with the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist was a sinner. But let's look at what Jesus does before this mere man. This is the first impression that Jesus reveals to us. If we want to become the followers of Jesus Christ, if we say we are the disciples of Jesus Christ, then we must go and represent who Jesus is. Whether it's a workplace or family or school, there we are the representation of Jesus Christ himself. The very first image, the very first impression Jesus revealed to his people is a humility. I have a hard time. This creator, this king of the universe, will kneel down before the sinner, John the Baptist, because the baptism happens as you go down into the water, immersed. So normally when the baptism happens in the church, how do you see it? A pastor will lay his hand upon the forehead of a person who is being baptized and put him into the water. The head is a crown of that person. You don't want to allow other people laying their hands upon your head. That's sometimes humiliating. But Jesus will go down before John the Baptist, the king of the universe, bowing his head, and the John the Baptist will press him into the water. That first image that he shows to us is humility. He did not come on a horse with the palms, with the flowers, with the balloons, with the, all his army shoulders, with the trumpets, but he came to show us how humble he is. He is the humble servant of God. And then John the Baptist couldn't take it. How? Because I cannot even take it if hypothetically Pastor Han or Pastor Kim will come to me and kneeling down before me. Hey, Shine, would you lay your hand and bless me and pray for me? Oh, no, no, I'm not worthy. It's not written in the book of Mark, but in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 33 and 34, John says, I mean 14 and 15, John says, and John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is a fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. What does this mean? Soon later, as he comes up from the water, we know that spirit like a dove will descend upon Jesus. The spirit cannot come into any person unless he totally fulfills the righteousness of God's law and ordinances. Jesus, as a mere man, perfect man, and perfect God, thus far, he kept all the laws by action, by deed, by heart, by attitudes. He perfected the law of God. And one thing that he had to do was to humble himself before John the Baptist and go into the water of baptism. Why? Because John was sent by God himself to baptize the people to prepare coming Messiah. Even though he was a Messiah himself, but he was a man as well. So he had to obey to fulfill all righteousness. That's why in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 33 and 34, that's why how he says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with the water said to me, this is John the Baptist confessing. He who sent me, God who sent me to baptize with the water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. Holy Spirit came upon Jesus because he perfected all the law of God. As a human being in his story, no one, perfected the law of God. Only Jesus has done it. Moses was a faithful servant in all house of God, but he also became angry 
And he broke the law. And that's why he was not able to enter into the land of Canaan. But Jesus, he perfected the law, fulfilled all righteousness, and then received Holy Spirit. And because he was endowed with the Holy Spirit, now he became the baptizer of the people with spirit and with the fire. But as we see, humility of Jesus Christ. The very first sin that we see from Jesus, that want to mimic and want to follow his example, want to learn from him is a huge humility. In different gospels, he was born in a manger. The very first sin that we see is a humility. As he was growing up in the book of Luke, it says, even though he was a God himself, he made himself a subject to his parents, to Joseph and Mary. As he was concluding his ministry, his 12 disciples said, who is the greater? Peter, are you greater? John? Oh, James, I'm the greatest among us. When they argue each other in a house because they need to be washed of their feet, but that job is given to the lowest the servant in the house. And they thought they were greater than all other, each other. And Jesus himself knelt before his disciples and washed their feet. Even after ascension, the image he shows us in the book of Revelation is a standing right next to his father as a lamb who was a slain, ready to serve the father. The images that he has shown to us is humility. The very first attribute of Jesus that we need to mimic and imitate is humility. You can say all-powerful disciple. You can say all things about Jesus and you can perform miracles. Without humility, you are not the proper presentation of Jesus Christ. He was a God, but he became subject to the man. In our relationships, we must understand clearly, if we want to serve God, apart from serving man or woman, we cannot serve the Lord. Because the Bible says, children, obey your parents. They are equally made. They are all human beings functioning same way. Children, however, obey your parents. Wives, obey your parents. Husband, men and women are equal, but in the household, wives obey your husbands. Slaves, servants, go to work, go to job, but serve your masters. But all these commands, we realize it's in the Lord. In the Lord. Obey your parents in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands in the Lord. Slaves, obey your masters Un, as if unto the Lord. What does this mean? As long as what they ask is, does not violate what God says we are to obey. Let's not deceive ourselves, thinking, I'm here to obey God, not man. No, that's not right. Everywhere in our relationships, whether we like it or not, there's a hierarchy. And God wants us to be subject to the people, by serving that man, by serving that woman, we are serving God himself. And Jesus himself became subject to the John the Baptist, to his parents, and to his disciples knelt before them. That's first the preparation. Humility leads us to preparation for the greater cause for his kingdom. And we see his humility. And with the humility, with the holiness, because he perfected the law and all righteousness has been endowed upon him, then the Holy Spirit came. So second preparation, second aspect of the how we need to be prepared before God is to make sure 
that we are endowed with the presence of God. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are anointed by the Holy Spirit, not by power, not by strength, but by the Spirit of the Lord. It's possible only by the Spirit. So from this beginning, after the baptism, this is a day of inauguration for the Messiah. All these years, until 30th year, he lived as a human being. He was a Messiah, but yet publicly, he was inaugurated as a Messiah for the world after he was endowed with the Holy Spirit. Everything from this day on, he will give us an example how to live Christian life. He was a human. I am human. You are human. But we rely upon Holy Spirit totally to fulfill his purpose, to reveal his glory, and to lead powerful Christian life. And that's why during his public ministry, everything he did, everything he said was led by the Holy Spirit as a perfect man. But the Spirit came upon him as a dove. Why, why dove? Why is it dove? Because dove has a symbolic meaning. Dove represents peace. And dove represents purity. And when we see Noah after flood, we'll send the raven out. But secondly, he sent dove out. And as he was returning, the bird was returning, she came with the olive leaf in her mouth. And that's the peace. No longer God will be angry and judge the world with a flood. And then second thing is, as we read Old Testament, especially in the Song of Solomon, Solomon represents the church, and the woman represents his bride, the Christ bride, the church, you and I. The way Solomon calls his bride, one of them is like this. 6 9, Song of Solomon, my dove. My undefiled is but one. She's the only one of her mother. She's the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her. Yeah, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Dove, my undefiled. And that's why Jesus, when he sent his disciples out to the world, it is as if I'm sending you out. In the midst of the wolves, be wise as serpents and be innocent or harmless as a dove. Holy Spirit descends upon us. That is a spirit of purity. That is a spirit of holiness. So we can see Jesus with his humility and with his holiness accepts Holy Spirit. If we want to be filled by the Holy Spirit, Remember, let us remember to retain humility and holiness. That is a way for us to be prepared for the greater cause for his kingdom. So we see his humility and we see his Holy Spirit. Then thirdly, God reaffirms who Jesus is. True identity is so important to be used by God. Knowing who I am in the Lord is so important because when the heaven opened up, voice came and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He was well pleased in the Lord and he was beloved son of God. And this is a beautiful scenery where Isaiah foresaw that and prophesied. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 1 through 4, this is how he says, Behold my servant, whom I am abhorred, my elect one in whom my soul delights, in whom I am well pleased. I have put my spirit, Holy Spirit, descended upon Jesus as a dove. He will bring forth the justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. And verse 3, a bruised reed, he will not break humility. And smoking flax, he will not quench. He will bring forth the justice 
for truth, he will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. And that prophecy right here in the baptism of Jesus has been fulfilled. But he is assured who he is. He's not miracle performer. He's not Savior. He's not Lord. Before God, he is the beloved son. That is identity of mine and yours. As we live in this world, we hold many, many titles, many, many labors. I'm a Korean-American by ethnicity. Citizenship, American. I'm a father in my house. I'm a husband to my wife. I'm an associate pastor to Pastor Han. And to you, I'm the lead pastor. All of us have a different hats to wear. All of us have a different titles. But those titles are mostly performance-based. But the only identity I want to uphold before Father is I am the beloved Son. With this, I can triumph over all the temptations and all the trials and all the sufferings, knowing my Father loves me and has accepted in me. Because before Jesus performed the miracle, God said, you are my beloved. Before he perfected obedience, dying on the cross, God already told him, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Before performance, before miracle, before healing, before accomplishment, I am the beloved son of God. That matters and settles everything. The only identity I want to hold on to and long for and desire is I am the beloved. I am is a beloved. Can we say to each other, you are beloved of, you are beloved daughter of God. You are beloved son of God. As long as we hear his voice from the Father, we can succeed, we can survive, we can sustain, and we can press on. And God had to reaffirm to his son, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we know how God prepares us with the humility, with the Holy Spirit, and then with a true identity before God. But that's not all. There's one more thing which we do not lie in. is that we must go through the school of wilderness. Isn't it interesting? Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. He can go immediately preach the gospel. Behold, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But he didn't. The Holy Spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tried, to be tempted by Satan. He was a weird beast and the angels. Our life is like that. We are in the hell wilderness. We walk with the Jesus, but there's a Satan continually tempting us. Wild beasts trying to attack us, destroy our lives. But at the same time, God will send us angels to minister us. But what does it mean that Jesus went through the wilderness for 40 days? Why was it necessary? Why? Because everything has to be proven before God's holy use. Everything has to be refined and proven and tested before God can use us. And that's why 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Prove all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. Jesus had to be proven. His lights went through 40 years of wilderness, we have to be proven before you see. If Son of God, the Messiah, was the first tried, let's expect trials, sufferings, wilderness will come. Discipleship does not happen only in the classroom. 
it's necessary. But God will Himself open up the school of wilderness. Why? What's in it? What's in the wilderness? I first become lonely. There's no other people. It's not a place to live. There's no water. During nighttime, I'm freezing. During the daytime, it's sunny, hot. No way to escape. No people around. It's not a place to live, but God allows wilderness in our life. Why? Why does He allow school of wilderness in our life? First, so that we may totally rely upon God alone. No one else. We get rejected. We get hurt. We get betrayed. Through that, we realize the only thing, the only person who I can rely is God himself. And second thing, in the wilderness, school of wilderness that we learn is our self, our ego will be broken. Through the suffering, through the trial, through the testing, our self and ego must be broken. Yes, I am endowed with the Holy Spirit, but when He speaks to me, how can I obey that voice unless my self is broken, unless my desire, my preferences are completely gone? How can I be follow the leading of the Holy Spirit unless I finish the school of wilderness first? It's not attractive, but it's a blessing. Moses was in the Midian night wilderness for 40 years. Totally his self, totally his ego was shattered. And then whatever God tells him, he will do. School of wilderness will have sweetness from our soul to follow out. Those are people who bypass school of wilderness, their ego their self bring out a smell of stinking smells. I love people who have gone through the wilderness. But there are different levels. School of Wilderness 101, 201, 501, or some of us 701. But if you try to bypass wilderness, remember, unless you pass 101, there will be no blessing. Pastor deceased who has who has who was a catalyst for Jesus movement. Chuck Smith in his book, A Memoir of Grace, he said this. The worst things that can happen to young pastor is early success. Pretty mature success will damage that person. Because we need to be humbled and we need to be broken to handle success, to handle accomplishment, to handle greater expansion of his kingdom. And there is, after this, immediately Jesus will go out to the Galilee and preach the gospel. Call his disciples. Cast the demons out. And heal the people. If we want to be prepared, make sure we want to retain humility because humility is a decision. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He who humbles himself shall be exalted, but he who exalts himself shall be abased. Humility is a decision. But humility does not mean absence of authority. Jesus had all the authority. With the authority, he was able to teach others. With the authority, he was able to cast the demons out. Yet, he chose to be humble. We can all do that. And there are people with absolutely no authority, no possession. Yet, I saw people being prideful. Humility is a decision. We decide to humble ourselves. Secondly, we retain humility and holiness to invite the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and make sure 
my identity other than anything else. I am the beloved son of God. I am the beloved daughter of God. And then let's welcome the school of wilderness. Then God will continually expand our horizon. God will continually take us to higher horizon, expand our territories, and endow us with a greater authority to impact the world. We are called to be the light and the salt. Let us all rise up. Jesus said, all of you who are laden and heavy burdened, come to me and learn of me, for I am meek and humble. Rarely, God, Jesus himself will tell us, learn from me, but humility. He told us, learn from him. As we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, Disciple making disciples. Then the first image Jesus portrayed to us was his humility. And I know quite often I stumble over this. But will we humble ourselves at our workplace? at our job, family, school. How are you portrayed? How do you represent Jesus? Do you represent Jesus as a cocky, rebellious, disobedient, unfaithful? We are sent to represent Jesus. So let's ask God, Ask God to humble us. Ask God to anoint us. Ask God to remind us true identity all the time. And let's ask God to give us the strength when we go through the wilderness. Let's call the name of Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Dear Father, we thank you so much, Father. As you have